It's good to see all of y'all. Um, I am Emma Williams. I work for the Center for Leadership Development and Faith Formation, and I also am the children's director at Grace Chapel up on the 380 corridor. Um, and I will be uh, leading us through this experience today along with CJ Rice. Um, CJ is uh, a veteran youth minister in the North Texas Conference and currently serves at FUMC Plano, the minister to youth and families. Uh, she also is um, an inaugural member of our A Time for Youth cohort, which uh, expands on the A Time for Children model in our conference um, and has worked with us uh, with CCYM. And uh, she's super uh, credentialed, so don't worry. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Um, so uh, CJ's uh, here to help us through this conversation as well, especially when we're talking about youth, uh, to talk about some practical things of what she's done um, in her youth group during this whole time. So um, if you have been following the <laughs> webinar schedule of um, our conference, which I know is kind of a lot to wade through, uh, this started out as a conversation in um, mid-March when we were thinking about what um, our children and youth pastors needed as resources. And in mid-March, we thought certainly by the end of April, we would have some recommendations for going back to in-person worship. And so that's what we put on the schedule. Uh, so something like next steps for children's and youth ministry. So if you saw that and now you've seen that it's changed, that's because it has, because we made it to mid-April and it turns out we still don't have a lot of concrete answers. Um, we don't have a lot of, um, this is exactly what should happen next. Um, this is gonna be the safest way for us to move back into our sanctuaries and into our education wings. This is going to be uh, the right answer. I think we all have found now that there just isn't gonna be a clear cut right answer. Um, and in that there's a lot of ambiguity and anxiousness um, that our leadership in our churches are feeling, um, but also um, our kids and our youth are feeling that because their um, activities are being canceled or postponed indefinitely and um, they're looking toward um, their parents, they're looking toward their pastors, they're looking toward um, their youth and children's leaders to figure out um, what's next. And so when we talked about what are our next steps uh, for children and youth ministries? We moved from how do we get back in person? Because once again, we're just, I mean, we don't have a clear answer on that. It's gonna be uh, probably different because some of us are in Forney and some of us are in Wichita Falls and everywhere in between. Um, so our next steps are less about um, how do we get back in person, but how do we help our children and youth walk through this time rather than sitting in sort of just the loss and the anxiety um, and the sadness. Um, and in our calls, if you've been on any of the calls with um, Dr. Terry Parsons or um, Leanne Hadley, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the grieving process and how it's not a linear process. Um, it is gonna go back and forth. Um, but ultimately out of that grieving process, uh, we're looking for the idea of making meaning. That something has, something has to come out of this process of grief um, that God promises us that meaning comes out of our experiences. And so what we wanna talk about today is um, that idea of how do we move children and youth from that loss and ambiguity and anxiousness to the certainty of God's love um, and to making some kind of meaning out of this crazy time. Um, and Joseph Bradley's gonna um, facilitate our slides here. So we'll um, start on this. Um, let me get this all set for my screen as well. Um, so as we look at uh, what we are called to do as people that work with children and youth. I think we are called um, to do some things very specifically because we're working with young people. We obviously have a theological call um, that we'll talk about. We have a call um, that God has placed on all of us um, to make disciples. We have a call 
to show God's love to our kids and our youth. Um, but because we're working with people who are still growing and learning um, very rapidly, we also have a call to help them develop mentally. And that doesn't exist outside of um, our call to be the church. Um, we want their development to come up alongside of our theological development um, so that they are learning and growing in the context of the church. And then we have a call relationally. We have a call uh, to connect with our kids and our youth in a way that um, allows them to grow. Um, we know that um, peer-to-peer -peer relationship is so important, especially as you get to adolescence. Peer, um, teens are looking at other teens for guidance um, and for uh, reassurance and uh, to look and see what's right. Um, and they also are looking toward us and they're looking at us which is kind of a scary thought but they're looking at us to say um what does this mean how why does this happen right why 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 can we not just end this like why does god not just end this they're looking at us um in a relationship of certainty that we have it all figured out and how do we help them walk through um figuring it out themselves um, and knowing that um, knowing that not everyone has everyone doesn't have it figured out and that's okay because God has it figured out. Uh, I found this quote actually this morning and I added it in and it was in one of my uh, or it's in a um, reflection from Richard Rohr that I get in my inbox every morning and it's talking about liminal space and specifically a dark liminal space. Um, so it's from a chaplain at the hospital talking about what it means to walk through um, the sort of time between diagnosis um, and death of uh, with for a person and their family. Um, and what she said was to heal from our suffering, not merely to ease or palpitate, uh, pal sorry, not, not merely to ease or palliate it, but to transform it into the source and substance of our growth and wisdom requires a journey through it. And that's really what we're going to talk about today is how do we journey through the pain and the loss? How do we not stay in the, the pain and the loss? How do we journey through it? So we go to the next slide. And if you've done um, any work with Leanne Hadley, this uh, will look very familiar. Um, this is a model for all ministry, really, um, that uh, she calls God-centered spiritual transformation. And uh, she will tell you, and you'll know if you've never talked about this before, that um, this model will look very familiar, even if you've never um, officially studied it, because this is the model that um, our lives take. This is um, life, death, resurrection. This is disorientation, reorientation. Um, and it's the model that a lot of our bi biblical stories go through. Um, so it starts um, at the top with sort of an entrance into a sacred space. You're given a spiritual tool. Sometimes that's um, just scripture um, or other sort of tools. And you, what we want to do is to move into this deep time of transformation. So, so moving away from the surface and away from the, um, uh, the church answers, the, the, the answers of Jesus, God, uh, uh, that's kind of thing. Um, so into this sort of deep time of transformation. And then once we get there, we want children and youth to be able to reintegrate, right? To not just take what they've learned um, and sit there, but then say, what does this mean for my life? Um, what does this mean for my friends and my family? And then we send them out with the blessing um, that both blesses the children and blesses us and reminds us that um, the children and youth that we work with are gods. Um, they are not ours to fix, they're ours um, to love as God loves. Um, and this um, part at the top, the spontaneous sharing is something that was recently added. Um, and it basically means that once we go through this you over and over and over again, once we experience tra transformation and we reintegrate into our lives, um, 
that we'll see children and youth begin to share with their um, family and friends. And in that way, they are sharing the gospel. They're fulfilling that great, uh, great commission. Um, and we see, especially, like I said, with teenagers, they start to change their peer group because teens look to other teens um, for that sort of, um, uh, for that sort of uh, blessing that it's okay to um, to be a Christian. It's okay to love God. It's okay um, to share your faith. Uh, so before we get started, I wanted to walk us through the story. If, um, if you follow the lectionary, this is the uh, scripture from this Sunday. Uh, and it really, as we're talking about how we have kids and youth understand what's going on right now, I think that scripture is a huge source of inspiration and hope because scripture is just a book of people who are going through some really hard times and God shows up and transforms them in some way. And especially this Road to Emmaus story, I thought was um, really pertinent to our the loss that we are feeling right now. Um, we did this exercise actually with our conference council on youth ministry. Uh, this Saturday, um, we read the road to Emmaus and then talked about um, using the listening stones, talked about where are you on the road and some really powerful images came out. And so I want to read this story for y'all. Um, and you can think about where you are on the road. Um, and then we'll also look at how this uh, fits into the you and how we can use this when we're talking about processing um, this whole situation with our um, children and youth. So if you want to follow along. I'm much more of a visual person, so we're at, in Luke 24. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of these things that have taken place over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priest and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen visions of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets have talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interrupted, or then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scripture for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what, they, what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. And so when we think about the road to Emmaus story, I've overlaid it on our you, thinking about how are we experiencing life, death, and resurrection. Um, the story begins with, I think, where we all are right now and where we have a tendency to get stuck, especially in this uh, time when there just isn't a clear answer to when everything will, will end. The disciples relive grief and loss. 
Um, and they do that for a large portion of this story. They're, they're reliving it with each other and they are telling this person, and who doesn't love to tell someone news that they haven't, someone hasn't heard, especially if it's uh, dramatic news. And that's what I think they're doing right here. That, but instead of processing through it, they're just reliving it. They're just saying, I can't believe you haven't heard this. And it's so sad. And someone said that his body wasn't there, but I don't know. I didn't see it. All I know is this horrible stuff that happened before. And they live this and they live up here in the top of the U in this grief. And then when we talk about um, a spiritual tool, we see um, that it, the scripture says that Jesus opens the scriptures for them and explains all of the things that um, scripture had predicted, scripture had, um, had said would happen. Uh, and we see them walk into Emmaus and what is the transformation but a shared meal, the, a meal that resembles the Eucharist, a meal that um, we know to be transformative in our lives. And their eyes were opened and then they reflected on their time with Jesus. They said, we experienced him opening the scriptures earlier. And then once we had this transformative experience, we understood what we were experiencing. And then they leave Jerusalem, they leave for Jerusalem changed, um, blessed by Jesus, and they move to share the good news. So in this Road to Emmaus story, we see um, maybe a model of what our response to the COVID-19 pandemic could be with, um, with children and youth, especially. So like I said, um, it's important to acknowledge the grief and the loss. And if you haven't watched um, either the webinar with Dr. Parsons or Leanne Hadley, I really suggest that you go back on our um, ntcumc.org page under COVID resources and check out those webinars because listening empathetically uh, without trying to fix problems, especially for kids uh, and youth who adults are constantly trying to fix their problems um, is a is a huge part of what's going to help them move through this grief. Um, but we can't stay there. We can't stay at the acknowledging grief part. And certainly every milestone that passes, every, you know, every birthday that you don't get to celebrate with your family or friends and uh, the graduations, those days will sting. Um, but, uh, but we have to be able to acknowledge them and move through them. Um, and so the next is that spiritual tool. Um, and CJ, I think especially, will talk about sort of, sort of some curriculum that'll help you um, in this spiritual tool part. But I think um, most simply, what you can do is use scripture to help process um, where kids are feeling, uh, if you want to sort of strip it down to um, just sort of the basic parts. So processing what you're feeling through the lens of scripture. Uh, and that's where this, uh, the heart, which is transforming grief into meaning. And that simply is not our work. That's the work of God. Um, we're going to set up the spiritual tool and we will set up the reflection and the blessing. But that transformation happens um, when when we put that work into the hands of God. Um, and then we move up to the reflection. Um, what have we gained in this time and how are we changed? Uh, and then the blessing that God is always with us, even in right now when things seem um, hopeless and when things seem um, unsteady, that God is the steady thing with us. Um, so constantly reminding kids um, of these certainties, it's something CJ is going to talk about as well. Uh, and when we do this, and we do this over and over again, and it won't be super successful every single time, but sometimes it really will be amazing. Uh, when we do this and we get kids in this practice, they will reframe our, they will reframe this pandemic for their friends and their parents and their congregations. Uh, they'll become leaders in their congregations and they will um, be the, uh, the hope that we need right now. Um, so part of, especially with, we can go to the next slide, especially with um, children and youth, part of our job is to help them when I'm talking, when we talk about developmentally, uh, is to help them have some perspective on what's going on right now. 
uh, it's very, of, of course we're sad that they're going to miss uh, final concerts. And of course we grieve with them that they're missing these special things that honestly we probably all got to do. And so a little bit is, um, is saying we, we don't, you don't dismiss it, but we have, um, as adults have the gift of a fully developed brain. Uh, the brain doesn't finish developing until like between 25 and 27. Um, and so when we're asking kids to have some perspective, uh, that is something that we're going to have to help them along with. And sadly, we're going to have to help them maybe a little faster than they want to because, um, because it's uh, time, it's time for us to keep moving. I keep a journal for my, uh, I have a, a three-year-old and a six-month-old and I keep like a little uh, like one line in a day journal for them. And I've been dating the, uh, the days of the pandemic since I've been at work is kind of what I started with. And I am pretty sure last night it was day 45. We are a month and a half into this. Um, and we need to help our kids. They, that means they have been grieving for a month and a half. Um, and if we haven't already helped them sort of along with caring perspective, um, and developing empathy and gratitude, that it's time to help them um, as a group uh, start looking for how we're going to grow out of this. doesn't have to be a silver lining per se. You don't have to think about it like that. It's not that we are happy that this happened so that we can trust God more, but because it's happened, it means that we um, have to find a way to um, grow in this time. And so part of that is empathy development. Uh, and I'm sure everyone under, understands what empathy is, right? Understanding other people's feelings. That's not something that we're born with. Uh, it's something that um, happens in our brain um, in that we can mirror people's emotions, but the actual ability to understand, I'm still on the first one, Joseph, no worries, you were right. Uh, the actual ability to understand um, and sympathize and empathize is something that we're taught over a over our entire adolescence. And this part is really important because we can't move down out of the surface of the U. So when you look at the U, that top is sort of the like, the fun stuff, the surface stuff, the things that you don't have to dig too far into. So empathy helps us move down toward that transformational moment when we can both name our feelings and others' feelings. And I found this, uh, when I was looking through all of this, I found something that said empathy is caught it's not taught. And that basically was referring to the fact that um, you don't have to sit kids down and teach them like empathy is when you understand other people's feelings. Um, now, sometimes those lessons are good, but you're not going to do that every day. What you're going to do is weave it into the ways that you teach um, children and youth throughout uh, your year. And uh, it's things like practicing when you engage in scriptures. I mean, who hasn't done, you know, what do you think that person was feeling? Um, if you were in this scripture, which person would you would be? Would, would you be? Um, so practicing um, recognizing feelings and recognizing others. Um, and we can increase these empathetic responses by noting similarities rather than differences. So uh, when we're talking about our communities and serving people, uh, to point out that um, our unity in Christ, right, or um, that person's the same age as you, or um, they want to be a doctor when they grow up, some things like that. So finding finding points of similarity rather than pointing out uh, differences, especially when we move into missional work, which a lot of our work is going to be during this time, um, both sort of... Uh, immediate need and also emotional need. Uh, and children and youth need help to develop these muscles. Um, even teenagers, they might think that they have all of this down, but uh, they are inherently selfish, not in a, not without, not in a judge, a judgmental way, but that's uh, how their brain is wired. They're, they're wired to look at um, who am I? Uh, who do I want to be? What is me? What is not me? They're figuring out who they are. And so um, they also need help uh, flexing those empathy muscles. And so uh, when you look at developing empathy, 
you can look at things like understanding you have distinct feelings and perspectives, recognizing your feelings, um, which is a big one for teenagers because during um, adolescence, that whole part of the brain is running on 150%. And the feelings that they are feeling are big and they are not sure what those are all of the time. Uh, so helping, helping them, especially uh, when you're reading other people's stories, helping them identify those feelings might help them identify the feelings inside of them. Uh, regulating emotional responses. Uh, once again, I have a three-year-old, so I know all about uh, the need to regulate emotional responses, um, but even in, uh, even in youth, um, there are explosive uh, feelings that um, that need help being regulated. Um, placing yourself in someone else's shoes, so the same sort of perspective. How would you feel if that were you? Um, and then lastly, imagining what kind of action or response might help a person feel better. And that's a big one for right now. Um, how are we going to serve people? What does somebody need? That need does not, is not necessarily going to be the same as my need. Um, maybe somebody needs to be listened to. Maybe somebody just needs to hear a funny story. Those are, could serve the same purpose, but they're very different needs. Um, and what we're looking for when we develop empathy is um, ultimately this idea of resilience. And I'm sure that y'all have done many a continuing ed on resilience, but right now uh, we need a specific kind of resilience. Um, it, and resilience is this inner strength that rises to meet needs. And um, when I was uh, looking at an article at, um, it's called the Greater Good Berkeley, and they do a lot of with social emotional learning. Uh, and they identified three different of these inner strengths, safety, satisfaction, and connection. Um, and right now, I think what our kids need is satisfaction. And by that, I don't mean, you know, the safety obviously is important in the connection, but they're getting a lot of um, these things. And of course, um, I guess I should have preempted this with, I'm not talking about kids that are, have lost someone um, to COVID-19, um, but I'm talking about kids that have lost um, sort of their social structure. And so when I think about, when I look at these, that, area of satisfaction stood out because if y'all have heard anything, uh, you have heard that your kids are bored. Who has not heard that they're bored? They want to go see their friends. They want to get out of the house. Maybe they are leaving the house, even though you don't want them to. Um, they are getting into everything if they're younger. And so the four, um, skills that they need to meet that satisfaction. This is because they're just in this listless place right now is mindfulness, um, which is being present in the moment. So not um, longing for something that was supposed to happen, but not happening. Um, so how do we practice mindfulness? Gratitude, which is a huge, um, a huge thing that we need to work on both children and youth with. Um, once again, not, not ignoring loss, um, but recognizing what we can be grateful for. Um, motivation, um, especially in youth, uh, pursuing opportunities in the face of challenge. So not just uh, saying, oh, well, this year is over. I guess nothing is going to happen um, or with our seniors, right? Like, uh, I guess, you know, maybe I'm going to start school in the fall or what if it doesn't start in um, in person, uh, so they need motivation to pursue, pursue and face those challenges, and then aspiration, um, looking to try and achieve results that are important for you. And so this could be with kids or with youth. Um, people need to find, people have an opportunity to find their gifts right now uh, in a way that is really needed, and that's not just adults, that's children and youth. Um, so finding what you're good at and how you can use it. Um, and resilience also means that you need to acknowledge what's lost and name what is given to you in this time. So that includes, like I said, providing a safe place for grief um, and a strong place for moving forward. Um, so the next slide just has uh, sort of what does this look like for children? Um, and it's some stuff we've already talked about practice taking on perspectives and that you can do that with um, 
I know a lot of people are reading, doing bedtime stories with their church, um, but you can do that in fiction or you can do that in the Bible. Um, practice taking on other perspectives and naming those feelings. What are they feeling? Uh, and that also will allow kids to create outreach and mission opportunities that they can drive in the community. Uh, and it doesn't have to, you know, they, a seven-year-old probably can't organize an entire food drive, but they can write letters to firefighters if they're worried about them. So that kind of thing, if they, they think about in their community who needs something, what do they need, and is there a way that that child or youth can fulfill that? Um, having children retell stories in their own words, once again, this can, uh, you practice it with their Bible stories, and then they can do it in real life. Um, and retelling stories doesn't have to just be telling stories that aren't theirs. A lot of times we tell children's stories for them. So helping them practice in the Bible retelling stories will help them tell their own stories. Um, and that helps them have that uh, resilience to know that um, they have some control in their narrative. Um, and then making lists of what they have lost and what they're grateful for with their family and just posting them around in this time. Uh, that's an, I know a lot of people are doing um, both sort of like Facebook Live children's times, but also some activities for kids to do at home. And this is a pretty easy one that a family can do together. Uh, and it both acknowledges the things that are lost, um, which is important. That's, it, lets, it lets there be a place to say, I didn't get to have my fifth grade play. Um, but also to post right next to it. Um, I get, I got to have dinner with both parents every night and, um, or um, I got to watch a movie with my sister, that kind of thing. So that's a, it's an easy activity to do um, or to have your children and family do during the week. Uh, and then this last point is, uh, this is a great time to expand children's leadership in, uh, both in your ministry and in the larger church. And so this is what I was talking about before. Um, this is a great time for if you can help your kids or, um, identify what they're good at uh, and what they might want to do, this is a great time for them to become leaders in your ministry and in the church's ministry if the church will have you, uh, will make some space for that. So. Um, letting them record a message. I saw a lot of um, children's recordings during Palm Sunday, which was awesome, or um, children reading Bible stories and posting those. So creative ways to expand the actual child's leadership during this time um, when uh, your pastors probably could use uh, some hope and a breath um, and congregations would love to see their faces and know that um, the children are leaders. Uh, and that helps them take this time that didn't make sense to them and become a time where they, um, where they found their meaning and found their worth and found uh, that their church family believes in them. Uh, so the last thing I have before CJ takes over is a list of books that actually our good friend Liz Diebold uh, provided for us uh, as resources for children um, both working through grief um, and not just to help them under some of them, uh, I think if I understand right, are particularly about the loss of um, a person, um, but most of them talk about just loss in general and change. Uh, and uh, a lot of it can be extrapolated out. So you can think about um, what you're what you're losing in this in the same way as losing a person uh, and that might help the kids understand because the loss right now is so abstract especially for young kids that are still there are still pretty concrete thinkers um, so these are good to take note of uh, Liz was the children's director at First Argyle for many many years and I trust basically anything she says so she said that these were great resources um, and so take those and run with them All right. Um, so I am in no means like by no means an expert at all, but um, I did just several weeks ago, like I was texting with Emma and I said, I don't know when it's appropriate for me to start like pushing these kids out of pushing my students out of like just this cycle of, of the same things that we are uh, 
frustrated about and that we're angry about, um, rightfully so, but like at what point is it appropriate? Um, because my natural inclination is to go ahead and start pushing as soon as I felt it. And I started feeling it two weeks in um, and then had to gain some perspective that says like, okay, this is where the teenagers are and they are different than I am. Um, and so that's kind of what got me roped into this conversation. Um, and so uh, thanks for having me. And so we'll just kind of get to it um, as best as I know how. Um, so we've been at this, like Emma said, for a really long time, like five, six weeks, kind of depending on when you started um, being at home and being online with your uh, students, with your kids, children or youth. Um, and so at some point, like Emma mentioned, uh, we have got to figure out a way um, to start moving toward the bottom of the U, toward heart transformation, start shifting the conversation um, so, that, so that we can make our way out of this, so that we can try, start to see hope, start to see um, how, how God has, is working in and through this. And so it's our job and our call to help them do this. And I just really think that should have been a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so if you haven't already started doing that, um, with your children and with your youth, um, I really encourage you to start ASAP, um, that this needs to start sometime really soon. Um, and you, um, you know your, your children and youth um, the best <laughs> because you're around them the, the most. I can't tell you exactly when that looks like, um, but when, when there starts to be just like this over and over and over cycle of like, we talked about this exact same frustration with the exact same verbiage last week, and the week before, then it's time for us to like move past that particular verbiage. And so um, use your discernment, pay attention to where your kids are. And when you feel like, okay, we are done with this conversation and we got to start moving towards that. Um, and obviously it's not, this doesn't necessarily exist the same, in the same way for kids who have pre-existing trauma that they have dealt with before COVID-19. This is very generic for like, COVID-19 time and the grief that has come from that, the loss that is coming from that. Um, and so use your best judgment and your discernment with those kids with pre-existing things. But generally speaking, like ultimately our job is to, is to look at the whole group and to figure out when we can take the whole group and the whole ministry toward um, moving forward uh, toward hope. Like that is our, that is our goal. Um, and so that we're not just like continuing to cycle through uh, the exact same things. Um, so, uh, a couple of things in curriculum or, or even just like conversation starters, I'm no curriculum expert, but I have started using a curriculum with my youth a couple of weeks ago that has been really, really helpful for me. And so I want to talk about that. And then just some other, um, basic ways of having conversations with our students that can hopefully lead us into this. Um, I'm speaking from a lens of youth ministry, but I do think that some of this, I actually know that some of this works with children's ministry as well. Um, but the first one is very youth ministry specific, and it is a curriculum that some of you may have already heard of, but the Fuller Youth Institute has, uh, has made um, this curriculum called Faith in an Anxious World. Um, it's on sale right now <laughs> um, for 37 something dollars. But if you really want it, you just email me and I will send it your direction. I don't know if that's allowed, but it's here we are being recorded and that's where we are. <laughs> Um, but kind of the basic structure of this, and it was written before COVID-19, so it has nothing specifically to do with, uh, with this particular world, but that teenagers are constantly in an, in an anxious um, and kind of depressive state um, with so much pressure that is being put on, on them as, as teenagers um, trying to grow up quicker than they should. And um, so... It's, it's a great curriculum that kind of helps guide in the direction of like, let's, let's figure out scripture. Let's figure out where Jesus is present. Let's figure out um, how Jesus was with Jesus's disciples and that like we can kind of put ourselves in those stories and start to find how steady and constant um, Jesus really truly promises to be and is. Um, and so there are videos that come along with that, um, that have high school students talking about some of the anxieties that they've experienced um, and how they have uh, worked through that um, with various resources around them. Um, there, like I said, there are um, continuous stories of Jesus with Jesus's disciples. Um, and when there have been like anxious times, which is like all the time, fun fact, um, how there have been anxious times and how Jesus never leaves the side of of his disciples is constantly right there. And so there's some repeat, repeating stories of that. And then there are some small groups discussion questions that come along with this curriculum as well. Um, and I just think like 
even past COVID-19, it's going to be a really, really helpful conversation for us to keep coming back to um, as teenagers continue facing um, just real struggles that we, that we see in their lives every day as we talk with them, right? Um, whatever those might be. But in this particular instance, COVID-19, losing prom, losing graduation, losing banquets, end of year concerts, all of those things, um, summer trips, camps. Um, so, um, but hoping or giving, giving hope to a situation that, that like we as Christians believe uh, that Jesus ha is risen and that is our hope, right? And so we have to keep coming back to that. That is our job to remind our kids that our hope is found in Jesus. It is not found in material things. It is not found in experiences that we have with our school friends. It is found in Jesus um, because Jesus has been um, resurrected, right? Um, so outside of faith in an anxious world, which I think is a great resource, um, we have to utilize scripture. Like Emma said, the Bible is full of stories of people suffering um, and struggling through X, Y, Z things. Um, and God shows up boldly, bigly, <laughs> and he shows up right there. And so uh, we have got to be utilizing scripture. And so you can pretty much like open like anywhere in the Bible and find stories of people who are struggling. I asked my youth a couple of weeks ago, um, where, where sometimes were you find, who, what characters are you finding in, in anxious times? And they were like, boom, 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 like every single character they've ever heard of and, and being able to point to the exact story and exact turning point of anxiety for them. Um, and so there are plenty of stories and our youth know them. So let's point back to them. Let's show them where God has shown up and been present in those spaces. Um, and then also doing a little plug for some listening stones here. And so Joseph, can you go to the next? Great. So these are listening stones. Some of you might know of them um, and some of you might not. It is a really, really helpful tool to help open up conversations. This works for children very well. I think that's, like, that's where it originally was like introduced to, um, but I know that it works for youth and actually really well with adults. <laughs> so like any person, uh, this will work well for. And so you can put these, stones on a screen for right now but or have them in real person when we whenever we get to back to that life um have them on the screen um ask them a question uh how is it with your soul um how is your heart feeling today how is your head feeling today is your body feeling today any of those kinds of questions that you want to be asking your uh your students and have them pick one or two stones and none of these have any meaning to them there's not a word on the back that says this is exactly what this means it means whatever it means to the kid, however they are going to interpret it. Um, and, and you will be so happily surprised at how open they become, um, way more than they would if you were just to say, how you doing today? Because all you're gonna get, and you know it, is the word, I'm all right, good, fine. <laughs> That's what we get from teenagers, right? And so with this, you're going to get um, kind of to the heart of where they are, whether it's really, really good or really, really bad, and you're going to get a feel for, um, for how they are. You can also use these listening stones when you are um, thinking about and interpreting through scripture, right? Um, so you read any scripture story, like Emma said, she read the Road to, Road to Emmaus scripture with our CCYM kids the other day and had them pick these out. And it took a second, but once they started opening up, like, man, it was some beautiful, deep thought and contemplation on the road to Emmaus scripture, right? That um, I hope we expect from our teenagers, but maybe sometimes don't, right? Um, and so you're going to get into some deep conversations um, and ways of knowing where your kids are. And before you know it, your time is going to be up, right? Like there's going to be so much sharing that is happening that you're going to be like, wow, we just got to the meat of what we needed to, and it took no structured script, no structured curriculum for you to get there. Um, so I highly encourage these. Um, they're on Leanne Hadley's website, free for anyone to take because Leanne is the nicest human to give us all of her stuff for free. Um, so Leanne Hadley's website, I don't know what it is. Leanne Hadley dot. She's cool. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so these are going to really help your kids. So as we know, children and youth, um, and even young adults and sometimes even adults, <laughs> there's so much going on that we have such a difficult time articulating what we're feeling, why we might be feeling it. And these listening stones I have found to be such an incredible tool to help people um, find verbiage, language, uh, to help articulate how they are really feeling um, just in the deep, deep part of their heart um, and, and be comfortable to share it and, and, in that space. Um, Okay, 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 okay. 
Um, and so also something else that I want that I've been thinking about is that like we, I have to remind myself of these things a lot um, is like, what am I able to control? What am I able to not, what am I not able to control? Um, and then thinking of that in terms of conversations with our students that says like, okay, so if we want to be focusing towards hope, and that is our goal, that there is hope. Uh, regardless of what's going on and how do we find that in the midst of just some real like not fun stuff um, is that we we need to be thinking about what are we certain of when it comes to who Jesus is what are we certain of when it comes to what scripture says what are we certain of when it comes to what we say the body of Christ looks like um, and then those are the things that we have to be focusing on rather than the things that we are uncertain about which is everything else <laughs> when do we get to see our friends again when do we get to be back at school? When do we get to be worshiping together again? Those are the things that we are not certain about, but the things that we are certain about are over here. And how do we keep bringing them back to this thing that we are definitely certain about? Um, so let's help our kids focus on those things. And then um, just another plug for another great space of resource. And I think some, maybe some of you youth ministers already know about these, but um, Princeton Theological Seminary, um, their Institute for Youth Ministry has made a page with like all the resources that you'll ever want. Uh, and it's very, very helpful. There is specifically a tab for, or a button for um, mental health support, which will bring a lot of conversation um, and helpfulness. That's actually where you can find the um, Faith in an Anxious World curriculum, um, other than just Googling it. But that's, that's where I found it from. And so I invite you, I think Joseph just threw that up in the chat. And so I invite you to go check that out um, with a lot of resources. And it, it actually might be very helpful for children as well in terms of just like helping guide in this way that says like we need to be kind of moving our kids into this into this heart transformation space instead of just continuing to sit in our loss and our grief um, with all of the things that are going on and so um, I just want to remind you that we are all called to walk alongside our students to meet them exactly where they are but that we are also called to like take their take them behind their backs and just and guide them along um, to to transformation to to the heart of God and so that is our call and we as hard as it might be even for ourselves to find to find our own hearts in that space that we are called to be doing those things um, and then and then beginning to ask the kids like what have we learned from this what are we gaining from our experiences here so that is what I have. Thanks. Um, so that um, basically concludes the uh, content portion of our webinar.